everybody, how's everyone going today? I'm Miguel Sanchez, and welcome to episode 16 of Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Guys, get ready, because in this episode, we're going to take a look at another Fairy Kill movie that no one's ever heard of, but, but, but we got to it anyway, so get ready, guys. What you're about to see, it's a totally, totally unreal. We already did uh, Local History 2, we already did... Uh, Logo history re retold based on the works of Rachi Ofro and Savannah. We still have Motion Monster the movie, The Great Watch Egg, and Motion Monster Biography coming up soon. But today we have well, we have this to get to take care of. So yes, welcome to episode 16 of Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. And without a way, let's get started. For today's episode, we are taking a look at Sleepy Beauty. Wondrous to see, glorious to hear. A beneficent new motion picture in Tender Color and Tenderama. <laughs> And that is what we're taking a look at today. So thank you all for coming and welcome to Movie History Wall Titty Anime Studios. Today we are taking a look at Sleepy Beauty and you have seen a previous episode, which was episode 15, uploaded a couple of days ago. And it was about Lady and the Tramp. So please check that out. I'll leave a link to it on the top right corner of the screen so you can check the video and see how it unfolds, whatever you want. But right now, everything must come to your store. So yeah, everything, uh, all the information you want to see are all provided by Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia. So thank you all for your support. And now, without the way, let's get started. So about the movie Sleepy Beauty is in 1959. American animated musical fantasy, uh, Amer American animated musical fantasy film produced by Walt Disney, based on Sleeping Beauty by Charles Perrault. The the sixteenth Disney animated fe feature film. It was released to, to theaters on January 29, nineteen fifty nine, by Buena Vista Distribution. It features the voices of Mary Costa, Eleanor Audley, Verna Felton, Barbara Letty, Barbara Jo Allen, Bill Shirley, Taylor Holmes, and Bill Thompson. The film was directed by Les Clark, Eric Larson, and Wolfgang Ratherman under the supervision of Clyde Gerenimi with additional story work by Joe Rinaldi, Winston Hippler, Bill Pete, Ted Sears, Ralph Wright, and Milt Banta. The film's musical score and songs featuring the work of Gronke, uh, the, of the Gronke Symphony Orchestra under the direction of George Bruns are arrangements or adaptations of numbers from the 1890 Sleeping Beauty Ballet by Pyar Ilyich Tchaikovsky. Sleepy Beauty was the first animated film to be photographed in Super Technorama 70, 70 widescreen process, as well as the second full length animated feature film to be filmed in anamorphic widescreen, following Disney's Lady and the Tramp four years earlier. The film was presented in Super Technorama 770 and six channel stereophonic sound in the first run engagements. In 2019, the film was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, his as as being culturally historically, or aesthetically significant. Whew, man, it's a lot of fun. Let's take a look at the movie's ads. Directed by Claire Giannini, as supervising Eric Larson, Wolfgang Ratherman, and Les Clark. Produced by Walt Disney. Written by Brad Erdman Petter. So story by... The story by Mil Milt Bansaw, Winston Hippler, Mel Pete, Joe Rinaldi, Ted Sears, and Ralph Wright. Based on Stephen Beauty by Charles Perrault. Starring Mary Cost Costa, Bill Shirley, Eleanor Audley, Verna Felton, Barbara Joletti, Barbara Jo... Jo... Uh, Barbara Jo Allen... Yeah, Barbara Letty, Barbara John Allen, Taylor Holmes, and Bill Thompson, narrated by Marvin Miller, music by George Bruns, adapted by Tchaikovsky, Sleepy Beauty Ballet, edited by Roy M. Brewer and Don Halliday, production companies of Walt Disney Productions, distributed by Board of Vista Distribution, release dates January 29th, 1959. Mm -hmm. Runtime, 75 minutes, countries, United States, language, language is English, budget is $60 million, $6 million, and the box office, $51.6 million in the United States and Canada. So now, my friends, now let's get into the plot. And we have a whole lot to get through. It's going to be one super-sized episode. So, great, guys. Here we go. Let's start with the plot. After many childless years, King Stefan and Queen Leah welcome a daughter, the Princess Aurora. A holiday is proclaimed to pay homage to the princess. At her christening, Aurora is bethroned to Prince Philip, the son of King Stefan's closest friend, King Hubert, to unite their kingdoms. Soon, the Royal Herald announces the arrival of three more guests, the three good fairies called Flora, Fauna and Merryweather. Flora and Fauna bless Aurora with beautiful and song, with beauty and song, respectively. But Merryweather's gift is interrupted by Maleficent, an evil witch who is furious about not being invited by the kingdom. As a retaliation, Maleficent curses the princess, proclaiming Aurora will prick her finger on the spindle of a spinning wheel and die before the sun sets on her 16th birthday. Although Maleficent's power is strong is too strong to undo, Merryweather uses her gift to weaken the curse. Instead of dying, Aurora will fall into a deep sleep until true love's kiss breaks the spell. Still concerned, King Stefan orders all the spinning wheels in the kingdom to be burned. The fairies know that Maleficent will not rest until she gets her away. So they convince the king and queen to let Aurora live with them in a cottage until uh, in a cottage hidden in the forest until she returns 16. 
Aurora is renamed Briar Rose and grows into a beautiful young woman. She does not know her guardians are fairies since they have disguised themselves as peasants. On her 16th birthday, they ask her to gather berries so they can prepare a surprise party. Aurora befriends the animals of the forest and sings the song Once Upon a Dream before... <laughs> Philip, now a handsome young man, follows Aurora's voice and is instantly struck by her beauty and grace. She is in initially startled, as she is not allowed to talk to strangers, but she and Philip fall in love. She invites him to meet her godmothers at the cottage that evening. Meanwhile, Meriwether and Flora argue to over Aurora's gown color, their magic attracting the attention of Beleficent's raven, Diablo. Returning home, Aurora is thrilled to tell her guardians that that she has fallen in love, not knowing that Prince Philip is the one. The fairies tell Aurora her true identity and she and that she is already bethroned. Diablo overhears the news and flies off to tell Maleficent. Heartbroken, Aurora cries in her room. Meanwhile, Philip tells her his father that he wishes to marry a peasant girl, despite his betrothal to a princess, and Hubert is left devastated. The fairies take Aurora to the, to the castle to await her birthday celebrations and be reunited with her parents. Maleficent appears and lowers Aurora into a dark tower with the spindle of a cursed spinning wheel, forcing Flora, Meriwether, and Fauna to stop and uh, to stop her. But but before they can, Aurora pricks her finger, fulfilling the curse. Only moments before the sun sets, when the fairies arrive, too late to save Aurora, Maleficent taunts the three fairies and their efforts to defeat her and reveal the sleeping princess before she uh, before she disappears. Feeling heartbroken about what happened, the three fairies place, sleep, place the sleeping Aurora on a bed in the highest tower and cast a powerful spell on everyone in the kingdom, causing them to sleep until the spell on their princess is broken. After overhearing a brief sleepy conversation in between the two kings, they realize that, that, that Philip is the man Aurora fell in love with in the forest. They rush to fight him, but they were too late as they discovered that Maleficent and her goons have abducted him. At the Forbidden Mountains, Maleficent shows Philip the sleeping princess Aurora and says she will lock him away until she until he is an old man on the verge of death. Only then she will release to me his love, who will not who, who will not have aged a single day. The fairies rescue Philip, arming him with a magical sword of truth and shield of virtue and escape from the Forbidden Mountains. An enraged Maleficent surrounds the castle with thorns but fails to stop Philip, she confronts him directly, transforming into an enormous black dragon. They battle, and Philip throws the sword, blessed by the fairies, directly into Maleficent's heart, killing her. Philip awakens Aurora with a kiss, breaking the spell and waking the kingdom. The royal couple descends to the ballroom, where Aurora is reunited with her parents. Flora and Meriwether resume their dispute over Aurora's gown until it finally becomes pink, while the couple shares a dance, living happily ever after. So that's everything you need to know. That's all I say. Let's take a look at the cats. Starting with the first roll, the voice enter, and then a bottle. So here we go. All right, so here we go. Prince Aurora, performed the voice by Mary Costa, modeled by Helen Stanley. Prince Philip, voiced by Bill Shirley, modeled by Ed Kember. Maleficent, voiced by Eleanor Audley, modeled by Jane Fowler and Eleanor Audley. Fairies, the fairies, Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather. Voiced by Verna Felton, Marva Joe Allen, and Barra Luddy, respectively. Perf modeled by Francis Favier, Madge Flake, and Spring Byington, respectively. King Stefan. Voiced by Taylor Holdman. Perf modeled by Hans Col uh, Han modeled by Hans Connery. Queen Leah. Voiced by Verna Felton. Modeled by Jane Fowler. King Hubert. Voiced by Bill Thompson. Modeled by Don Barclay. Maleficent Goons. Voiced by Bob Ams Amsbury, Kenny, Cadi Kenny Cadido, and Pinto Colbeck. No models for these characters. Harold. Voiced by Hans Conrad. No model for this character. Owl and Diablo. Voiced by Dallas Buchanan. No voice at uh, no model for these for these characters. And narrator Marvin Miller. No actor. Uh, narrator. Voiced by Marvin Miller. No no model for this character. Let's go to the directing Anna Bears. Mark Davis. For Princess Aurora and Maleficent, Milt Call for Princess for Prince Philip, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson for the three good fairies, Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather, and John Lasbury for King Hebert and King Stefan. Now, Eric Larson did not animate any of the characters in for the film. Instead, he directed the entire forest sequence, which stretches from Briar Rose, aka Aurora, wandering through the forest with her animal friends, all the way to Princess Aurora, renamed to Briar Rose, running back home. Promise you, Philip, they will meet again later in the evening. This was the only time Larson directed a sequence or a film 
of during his tenure at Walt Disney Productions. Now let's move on to production, story by story developments. And boy, it's going to be a long one, so get ready, guys. In November 1950, Walt Disney announced he was developing Sleepy Beauty as a feature animated film. Writing on the film began in, uh, began in early 1951, which in which the partial story elements originated from discarded ideas for Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, including Maleficent's capture of Prince Philip and his dramatic uh, escape from her fortress, and Cinderella, where a fantasy sequence featured the leading protagonist, Stancy on a cloud, which was developed, but eventually, but, uh, but eventually dropped from the from the film. By the middle of 1953, director Wilfred ja Jackson had recorded the dialogue, assembling a story reel, and was to commence for preliminary animation for a work where Prince Aurora and Prince Philip were to meet in uh, in the forest uh, and dance. Though Disney decided to throw out the sequence, delaying the film for from its initial 1955 release date. For a number of months, Jackson, Ted Sears, and two story writers underwent a rewrite of the story, which received a lukewarm response from Disney. During the, uh, during the story rewriting process, the story the writers felt the original fairy tale's second act felt bizarre. It felt bizarre, and with the wake up kiss serving as a climactic moment, they decided to concentrate on the first half of finding on the first half finding strength in the romance. However, they felt little romance was developed between the strange prince and the princess that the story for artists worked on an elaborate sequence in which the king organized a treasure hunt. The idea was eventually dropped when it became too drawn out and drifted from the central storyline. Instead, it was written that Pr Prince Philip and Princess Aurora would meet in the forest by a ran by random chance, while Princess Aurora, who was renamed Briar Rose, was con conversing with the forest animals. Additionally, because the original Pearl take uh, tale had the uh, uh, the chance uh, had the curse last 100 years, the writers decided to shorten it to a few uh, hours, with the time spent for Prince Philip to battle the goons, overcome several obstacles, and fight uh, and fight off against um, Maleficent. And transformed uh, into a dragon. Their name, given to the princess by her royal birth parents, is Aurora, Latin for Dawn, as it was to the original Tchaikovsky Key Ballet. This name occurred in Charles Perrault's version as well, not given as the princess's name, but as her daughter's in hiding. She's called Brian Rose, the name of the princess in the Brothers Grimm's version variant. The prince was given the princely name most familiar to Americans in the 1950s, Prince Philip, named after Prince Philip the Duke of Edinburgh. The character has distinct has the distinction of being the first Disney princess to have a name uh, as the two princes in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, like as the prince and Cinderella, as Prince Charming, are never named. By the way, rest in peace. Look at that. Rest in peace, Prince Philip. Uh, we will forever miss you. Yeah, uh, You ruled England for a long time. Now, we say goodbye to you. Prince Philip, we're going to miss you. Um, in December 1953, Jackson suffered a heart attack, as a result of which directing animator Eric Larson's, uh, Eric Larson of Disney's Animal Men took over as director. By April 1954, Sleeping Beauty was scheduled for a February 1957 release, with, with Larson as the director. Disney instructed Larson, whose unit would animate the forest sequence, that the picture was to be a moving illustration, the ultimate in animation, and added that he did not he did not care how long it would take because of the because of the delays, the release date was again pushed back from uh, from Christmas 1957 to Christmas 1958. Fellow Night Man Milt uh, Milt Call would would blame Walt for the numerous release days delays because he wouldn't have story meetings. He would get the damn thing moving. Uh, uh, relatively late in production, Disney removed Larson as the supervising director and replaced him with Clyde Jarnimi, directing animator Wolfgang Reitherman would join Jarnivi as the sequence director over the climatic dragon battle at sequence, commencing that we took the approach that we were going to do, uh, that we were going to kill that damned prince. Les Clark, another member of the Nine Old Men, would serve as the sequence director of the elaborate, of the elaborate opening sequence, opening scene where crowds of, of the citizens in the kingdom arrive at the palace for the presentation of Princess Aurora. So there you go, my friends. That's everything you need to know. I'm just about about three and a half minutes of information in the story development. Moving on to the art direction. The the art the the animation style moved away from the Rococo of Cinderella and also does not simply draw on fashion and female beauty standards of the time and draws upon distinctive visual con combination of medieval art imagery and art deco design. 
Uh, Kay Nielsen, whose sketches were the basis for Niall Bob Martin in Fantasia, was the first to produce Starlink sketches for the, for the film in 1952. The artistic style was originated when John Hench observed the famed unicorn tapestries at the, clo clo uh, at the cloisters located uh, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. When Hench returned to the Disney Studios, he brought reproductions of the tapestries and showed them to Walt Disney, who replied, Yeah, we could use that style for Stevie Beauty. Uh, Avent Earl joined Walt Disney Productions in 1951, first employed as an assistant background painter for Peter Pan, before being promoted as a full-fledged background painter in the Goofy cartoon for uh, for whom whom the balls told, and the color silence of the Academy Award-winning short Toot Whistle Plunk a Boom. For Sleepy Beauty, Earl said uh, the Earl said he felt totally free to put my own style into the paintings, and uh, he. To the paintings he based on Hench's drawings, stating where his trees might have curved. I strained them out. I took a Hench and, and took the same uh, subject and the composition he had and just turned it and turned in into my style. Furthermore, Earl found inspiration in French Renaissance utilizing works from Albrecht Duel, Limburg Brothers, Pietro Brugel, Nicolas van Eyck, Sandro Botticelli, as well as Persian art and Japanese prints. Where when uh, when Jeremy became the supervising director, Earl Jeremy entered furious creative differences. And the Jeremy commented that he uh, that he felt Earl's paintings lacked the mood in a lot of things, all that beautiful detail in the trees bark in the trees the bark and all that. That's all well and good, but who the hell's going to look at that? The backgrounds became more important than the animation. He made them more like Christmas cards. Earl left the Disney Studios in March in 1958 before Sleeping Beauty was completed to take job at a at, a, at John Sutherland Productions. As a result, Jeremy had Earl's background paintings softened and diluted from their distinctive medieval texture. Hmm. That's pretty much it. Moving on to animation. Sorry, with live action re reference. Before the animation process began, a live-action reference version was filmed with live actors in costume serving as models for the animators in which Walt Disney insisted on because he wanted the characters to appear at, as real as possible, near, near flesh and blood. However, Milt Call objected to this method, calling it a, a crutch, a stifling of the creative effort. Anyone worth his salt in this business ought to, uh, ought to know, ought to know uh, how people move. Helen Stanley was a live-action reference for Princess Aurora. The only survive, the only known surviving footage of Stanley as Aurora's live-action reference is from is a clip from the television program D Disneyland, which consists of of the artist sketching of her dancing with the television organ, uh, with the uh, which consists of the artist sketching her dancing with the woodland animals. Stanley, pre Stanley previously provided live-action references for Cinderella and later for. For Anita for 101 Dalmatians and portray Polly Crockett for the TV series Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. And yes, I'll talk about 101 Dalmatians in the next episode of the series, so please stay tuned for it when it comes out. Uh, the role of Prince Philip was modeled by Ed Kember, who had played Commander Buzz G G Corey on television's Space Patrol five years before Sleepy Beauty was released. For the final battle sequence, Kember was photographed on a wooden buck. The live action model for Maleficent was, uh, was Eleanor. Oddly, who also voiced the villain, dancer Jane Fowler, also, also was a live-action reference for Maleficent. Among the actresses who performed in reference footage for this film were Spring Byington and Francis Bavier. The role of King Stephen was modeled by Hans Conried, who had previously modeled Captain Hook and George Darling in Peter Pan from 1953. So, yeah, let's move on. Staying with the animation, let's move on to character animation. Because of the artistic depth of, of Earl's backgrounds, it was decided for the characters to be stylized as they could, as they could, as it was decided for the characters to be stylized so they could appropriately match the backgrounds. While the layout artists and animators were impressed with Earl's paintings, they eventually grew depressed at working with a style that many of them regarded as too cold, too flat, and too modernist for a fairy tale. Nevertheless, Walt, Walt insisted on the visual design, claiming that the inspirational art he commissioned in the in the past had uh, homogenized the animators. Frank Thomas would complain to Kevin to Ken Pe Peterson, head of the animation department of Earl's very rigid design, because of the inhibiting eff effect on 
on the animators that was less problematic than than working with Mary Blair's designs, in which Peterson would would respond to that design style uh, was Walt's decision, and that, like it or not, they had to use it because that because of this Thomas developed a red blotch on his face and had to visit the doctor each week to have it attended to. Production designer Ken Anderson also complained, I have to fight, I had to fight myself to make myself draw, uh, draw that way. Another character animator on Aurora claimed that her unit was so cautious about the drawings that the cleanup animators produced one drawing, uh, one drawing a day, which translated into one second of screen time per month. Meantime, uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, meanwhile, the top aura was tasked as character stylist that that uh, that would not only inhabit the style of the backgrounds but also fit with the contemporary UPA style. Likewise, uh, uh, likewise with Earl's background styling, the animators complained that the characters' designs were too rigid to animate. Oreb had uh, or had originally designed Aurora to resemble actress Audrey Hepburn, but according to ad ad animator Ron Diaz, Avon redesigned her. She became very angular, moving with more fluidity and elegance, but her design had a harder line. The edges of her dress became squarer, pointed even, and the back of her head came almost to a point rather than round and cuddly like the other Disney girls. It had to be it had to be done to complement the background. For Maleficent, animator Mark Davis drew from Czechoslovakian religious paintings and used the red and black drapery in the back that looked like flames that I thought would be great to use to use. I took the idea of the collar partly from the, from a bat, and the horns looked like a devil. However, in an act of artistic compromise, Earl, with the final approval on the character designs, requested the change to a to lavender, as red would come off too strong, in which D in which Davis agreed to. Veteran animators Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson were assigned as directing animators over to the three good fairies, Flora, Fauna, and Merryweather. Walt Disney urged for the fairies to be more homogeneous, which Thomas and and Johnson objected to. With Thomas stating that they uh, that that thought that's not going to be any fun, so we started figuring the other way. So we started figuring the other way and worked on how we could develop them into special personalities. John Lonsbury animated the scump sequence between. Between King Hubert and Stefan Chuck Jones, known for his work at as animator director as animation director with Warner Brothers cartoons, was employed on the film for four months during his early conceptual stages. When Walt, when Warner Brothers cartoons was closed, it was anticipated it was anticipated that 3D film would replace animation as a box office draw. During its early concept, during early conceptual stages, when when Warner Brothers cartoons was closed, it was hmm, following the failure of 3D. In the reversal of Water's decision, Jones returned to the other studio. His work on Sleeping Beauty, which he spent four months on, remained remained uncredited. Ironically, during his early years at, at Water Brothers, Jones was a hev was a heavy user of Disney style animation until Tex Avery got got water out of the Disney style. Another notable animator who worked on the film for part of, for part of its production was Don Bluth. Who worked as an as as an assistant animator to Lansbury. Bluth would leave after two years, but eventually came back in the nineteen seventies. <clears throat> Man, that's a whole lot of fun. Let's go to the casting. In nineteen fifty two, Mary Costa was invited to a dinner party where she sang "When I Fall in Love" at the then named Los Angeles Conservatory of Music. Following the performance, she was approached by Walter Schumann, who told her, "I don't want to shock you, but I've been looking." For Aurora, for three years, and I want to step, uh, I want to step up and uh, an audition. I, I want to set up an audition. Would you do it? Costa accepted the offer, and at and at her audition in the recording booth with George Bruns, she was asked to sing and do a bird call, which she did initially in her southern accent until she was advised to do uh, an English accent. The next day, she was informed by Walt Disney that she landed the role. Eleanor Audley initially turned down the choice. On the role of Maleficent, as she was battling tuberculosis at the time, but reconsidered. Yeah, for the music in November 1952, Billboard reported that Jack Lawrence and Sammy Fain had signed to compose the score. In the following year, Disney decided 
the, the score should be based on Peter Tchaikovsky's Sleepy Beauty Ballet, which rendered the songs Lawrence and Fane have written unusable, except for Once Upon a Dream. Walter Schumann was originally slated to be the film composer, but he left the project because of creative differences with Disney. George Bruns was recommended to replace Schumann by animated Ward Kibble. Because of a musician's strike, the musical score was re was recorded in Berlin, Germany, with the Gronke Symphony, or uh, with the Gronke Symphony Orchestra <clears throat> from September 8th to November 25th, 1958. All lyrics are written by Tom Adair. All music is composed by George Bruns. So let's take a look at the songs. So I'm with the number, the by, followed by the title, performance, and the length. Number one, main title, slash one spot stream, slash pro prologue, performed by the chorus, runtime, two minutes and 57 seconds. Number two, hail to the Princess Aurora, performed by the chorus, runtime, one, one minute and 57 seconds. Number three, the gifts of beauty and song, slash Maleficent appears, slash true love conquers, uh, conquers all. Run, uh, no, no performers, runtime, five minutes and 38 seconds. Number four, the burning of the spinning wheels. Slash the fairy's plan. Nope. No runtime. No, yeah, no performers. Runtime. Four minutes and thirty-two seconds. Number five. Maleficent's frustration. No performers. Runtime. Two minutes and eight seconds. Number six. A cottage in the woods. No performers. Runtime. Three minutes and twenty-seven seconds. Number seven. Do you, do you hear that? Slash I wonder. Performed by Mary Costa for I wonder. Runtime. Three minutes and fifty-seven seconds. Number eight. An unusual prince. Slash once upon a dream. Reprise. Performed by Mary Costa and Bear Shirley for once upon a dream. The reprise. Runtime is three minutes and twenty-nine seconds. Number nine. Magical. The house clean slash blue or pink. No performers. Runtime two minutes and forty seven seconds. Number ten. A secret revealed. No performers. Runtime one minute and fifty seven seconds. Number eleven. Scumps. Tricky song and the royal argument. Scumps. Tricky song slash the royal argument. Performed by Taylor Holmes and Bill Thompson for Scumps. The Tricky song. Runtime four minutes and nine seconds. Number twelve. Prince Philip arrives slash how to tell Stefan. No performers. Runtime is two minutes and twenty six seconds. Number thirteen. Aurora's return slash Maleficent's evil spell. Well, yeah, I love it. No, uh, no performers. One time, five minutes and six seconds. Number number fourteen. Poor Aurora slash Sleepy Beauty performed by the chorus for Sleepy Beauty. Run time two minutes and fifty seven seconds. Number uh, number fifteen. Forbidden Mountain. No performers. Run time two minutes fifty one seconds. Number sixteen. Fairy tale. A fairy tale come true. No performers. Run time. Two minutes and forty seconds. Number seventeen. Battle with the forces of evil. No performers. Run time five minutes eleven seconds. Number eighteen. Awakening. No performers. Run time two minutes and forty four seconds. And finally, number nineteen. Finale. Once upon a dream. Performed by the chorus. Run time one minute and forty three seconds. Whew, man, that's a whole lot. We got the classic Disney sixty. The classic Disney sixty years of musical magic album includes Once Upon a Dream on the green disc and I Wonder on the purple disc. Additionally, Disney's greatest hits includes Once Upon a Dream on the blue disc. The nineteen seventy three LP compilation Fifty Happy Years of Disney Favorites, Disneyland Stair Dash Three Five One Three includes Once Upon a Dream as the seventh track on side four, as well as a track titled Bluebird. I Wonder, labeled as being from this film with authorship by Hibbler, Sears, and Bruns. Same set, side two, track four. Yeah. Although Bruns took much credit for the score, he derived most of his work from the, from the themes and melodies in Tchaikovsky's ballet, Sleeping Beauty. Uma Sudak covered I Wonder for, for the first day awake uh, in 1988. No Secrets performed a cover version of Once Upon a Dream on the album Disney Mania 2, which appeared which appears as a music video on the Justin 3 DVD. More recently, Emily Osmond sang a remake of Once Upon a Dream released on the Disney Channel on September 12, 2008 and included... And on the Platinum Edition DVD and Blu-ray disc in the 2012 album, Disney Kone, o, ne, kone, o, ne, kone no Uchisama, which featured various Japanese voice actors covering Disney songs, What's Upon a Dream, was covered by Toshiyuki Morikawa. <sighs> Toshiyuki Morikawa. I remember her name. I remember that name. Uh, in anticipation of the 2014 film Maleficent, a cover version song by Lana Del Rey was released by Disney on January 26th. The song is considerably darker and more dramatic than the 1959 version. Giving, uh, given the new film's focus on the villain Maleficent, the song was the song was a, was a in a trailer for the film, shown as a commercial break during the 2014 Grammy Awards, and was released for free on Google Play for a limited time. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Let's go to the release. Starting with the original theatrical run. Disney's distribution art. Right, Buena Vista distribution. Originally released Sleeping Beauty to theaters in both standard 35mm prints and large format 70mm prints. The Super Detective Robin 70 prints were equipped with six track stereo phonic sound. Some cinema scope compatible 35mm Detective Robin prints are, uh, they were released in four track stereo, and others had uh, monaural soundtracks. 
The film premiered in Los Angeles on January 29th, 1959. On its initial run, Saving Beauty was paired with the short musical slash documentary film Grand Canyon, which won an Academy Award. During its initial release on, in January 1959, Saving Beauty grossed approximately $5.3 million in theatrical rentals. The distribution, the, the, the distributor's sale of the box office gross. From the United States and Canada, Sleeping Beauty's production costs, which totaled $6 million, made it the most expensive Disney film up to that point, and over twice as expensive as each of the preceding three Disney anime features, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, and Lady of the Tramps. So, again, Peter Pan, Lady and Tramp was on episode 15, Peter Pan was on episode 14, Alice in Wonderland was on episode 13, get these three watch you haven't seen yet. The high production costs of Sleeping Beauty, coupled with the underperformance of much of the rest of Disney's 1959-1960 release slate, resulted in the company posting its first annual loss in a decade for fiscal year 1960, and there were massive layoffs throughout the animation department. <sighs> Man, there's a whole lot. Let's go to, move on, we go to releases. Like Alice in Wonderland for 1951, which was not initially successful either, Sleeping Beauty was never re-released theatrically in Walt Disney's lifetime. However, it had many re-releases in theaters over the decades. The film was re-released theatrically in 1970, where it was released on standard 35mm film. The release garnered rentals of $3.8 million. It was re-released in May 1979 at the Crest Theater in Seattle in 70mm and 6-channel stereo and went into wider release later the same year in both 70mm and 35mm stereo and mono. It had a further reissue in 1986 when it grossed $15 million in the United States and Canada, and again in 1995. It was originally going to be re-released in 1993, as was advertised on the 1992 VHS release of Beauty and the Beast, but it was cancelled and pushed back two years later to 1995. Sleepy Beauty's successful reissues have made it, uh, have made it the second most successful film Released in 1959, second to Ben Hur, with a lifetime gross in the United States and Canada of 51.6 billion dollars. When adjusted for ticket uh, inflation, for ticket price inflation, the domestic total gross comes out to nearly 691 million dollars, placing it within the top 40 of films. From July 9th to August 13, 2012, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences organized the last 70 mm uh, uh, film festival at the Samuel Goldwyn Theater, where the Academy, its members, and the Hollywood industry acknowledged the importance, beauty, and majesty of the 70, of the 70 millimeter film format, and how its image and quality is superior to that of digital film. The Academy selected the following films, which were shot on 70 millimeter, to be screened to make a statement about it, as well as to gain new appreciation for familiar films in a way it hadn't been it had it had before. It's a mad, 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 mad world. Sleepy Beauty, Grand Prix, The Sound of Music, 2001 The Space Odyssey, and Spartacus, along with other short subject films on the 70mm format. A screening of the final remaining 70mm prints of this film was included in the 70mm and widescreen film festival at the Somerville Theater, September 18th, 2016. Whew, man, that's a lot of fun. We went on to whole media, and it's going to be a lot. Another big one, so here we go, guys. Sleepy Beauty was released on VHS, Betamax, and Laserdisc on October 14, 1986, in the Classics Collection, becoming the first Disney Classics video to be digitally preceded, uh, to be digitally processed in the Hi-Fi in Hi-Fi stereo. During its 1986 VHS release, it sold over one million copies. The release went into moratorium on March 31, 1988. The VHS was first released on November 6, 1989, in the United Kingdom. The VHS was first released on around 1988 to 1990 in over 20 language in over 20 countries worldwide. The film underwent a digital restoration in 1997, and that version was released to both, to both VHS and Laserdisc in widescreen as part of the Masterpiece Collection. The 1997 VHS edition also came with a special commemorative booklet included, with brief facts on the making of the movie. The VHS was, was re-released on, on around 1994 to 1997 in over 30 countries worldwide. In 2003, the restored Sleeping Beauty was released to DVD in a two-disc special edition, which included both a widescreen version format at 2.35 by 1, and, and a pan and scan version as well. Its DVD supplements include the included the making of featurette from the 1997 VHS Grand Canyon, the Life Tchaikovsky segment from the Peter Tchaikovsky story from the Walt Disney Anthology television series, a virtual gallery of content art, layout, back, the layout and background designs, three trailers, and audio commentary from Mary Costa, Avid Earl, and Ollie Johnson. The special edition DVD was released on around 2002-2004 in over 40 countries worldwide. 
A final edition release of Sleeping Beauty as a two-disc DVD and Blu-ray was released on October 7, 2008 in the U.S., making Sleeping Beauty the first entry in the Platinum Edition line to be released in high-definition video. The release is based upon the 2007 restoration of Sleeping Beauty from the original tinted color negatives and the positives several generations removed from the original negative were used for other home, other home video releases. The new restoration and the feature of the film it is full negative as aspect ratio of 2.55 by 1 wider than both the uh, wider than both the uh, prints shown at the film's original limited and uh, set robot engagements at 2.20 by 1 and the cinemascope compatible uh, reduction prints for general release at 2.35 by 1 the blu-ray set features bd live an online feature and the extras included include a virtual castle and multiplayer games the Blu-ray release also includes disc 1 of the DVD version of the film. In addition to the two Blu-rays, the DVD includes a music video with a remake of the Disney classic Once Upon a Dream, sung by Emily Osment and featuring Daniel Romer as Prince Philip. The Platinum Edition DVD was released in, on October 27, 2008 in the UK. The Platinum Edition DVD and Blu-ray were released in, on October 2008-2009 in, in over 60 countries worldwide. The Blu-ray format of any Disney feature produced by Walt Disney himself. The film was released on a diamond edition, a Blu-ray, DVD, and digital HD on October 7, 2014. After six years, it's its first time on Blu-ray. On Blu-ray, The diamond edition, Blu-ray, and DVD were released on around 2014 in over 80 countries worldwide. Slavery Beauty was re-released on HD digital download and Blu-ray on September 24, 2019 as part of the Walt Disney Sister Signature Collection in honor of the film's 60th anniversary. Man, it's a lot of fun. Let's go to the reception. So, a critical response. Bosley Crother, writing in his review for the New York Times, complimented that the colors are rich, the sounds are luscious, and magic sparkles and splurt charmingly from wands, but criticized its similarity with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. He further wrote that the princess looks so much like Snow White, they could be a couple of Miss Renegolds separated by three, by three or four years. And she has the same magical rapport that with the little creatures of the woods. The witch is the same slanted, slant-eyed circ who warred her evil on Snow White. And then the three good fairies could be maiden sisters of the misogynistic seven dwarfs. Time harshly wrote that even the drawing in Sleeping Beauty is crude, a compromise between sentimental crayon, crayon book childishness and the sort of the and the sort of cute commercial cubism that tried to seem daring, but is really but is really just square. The hero and heroine are sugar sculpture, and the witch looks looks like a clumsy track you know, tracing from a Charles Adams cartoon. The plot often seems to owe less to the tradition of the fairy tale. To uh, then to the formula of the monster movie in the final reel, it is not uh, is not a mere old, uh, a mere old fashioned which the hero has to kill, but the very latest model of the thing from forty thousand fandoms. Harrison's reports noted that it is doubted. It is doubtful. However, if it, if adults will find as much satisfaction as in Sleeping Beauty as they did in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, with uh, with which this latest effort will be assured compared, because both stories are are in many respects similar. While beauty's while beauty is unquestionably superior from the viewpoint of the art of animation, it lacks comedy characters that can be compared favorably with the Unforgivable Seven Dwarfs. Among, may, among, among more favorable reviews, Variety praised the singing voices of Mary Costa and Bill Shirley and noted that some of the best parts of the picture are those dealing with the three good fairies, spoken and sung by Verna Felton, Barnard, Barbara Jo Allen, and Barbara Liddy. Kate Cameron, reviewing for the, New York, for, for the New York Daily News, described the film as enchanting and as a picture that will charm the young and tickle adult. Adults, since the old fairy tale has been transferred to, to the screen by a Disney who who kept his uh, tongue in his cheeks throughout the film's animation. In a retrospective review, Kerry R. Whedon of, of Common Sense Media gave the film 5 out of 5 stars, writing, Disney classic is delightful, but sometimes scary. The review aggregator website Rotten Tomatoes reported that the film received a 90% approval rating with an average rating of 8.2 out of 10 based on 40 reviews. Its consensus states that, dis that this Disney dreamscape 
and con contains moments of grandeur with its lush colors, magical air, and one of the most menacing villains in the Disney canon. Mm. I love it. Move on to the awards and honors. Academy Awards, best scoring of a musical picture for George Burns, lost against uh, lost against Porgy and Best Grammy Awards, best uh, best soundtrack album for original cast uh, uh, in a motion picture or television, lost uh, lost again to Porgy and Best Young Art Young Artist Award, but for, uh, Young Artist Award best musical entertainment featuring youth for TV or motion picture, but uh, but lost again this time at uh, the, this time again not this time against Nutcracker Fantasy. And other and for other honors, this film is recognized by by, by American Film Institute by in these lists. 2003 to in 2003, AFI's 100 Years, 100 Heroes of Villains, Maleficent, nominated villain. In 2006, AFI's Greatest Movie Musicals, nominated, and 2008, AFI's Top 10 Top 10, nominated anime film. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Moving on to the legacy, starting with, starting with video games. In the Kingdom Hearts video game series by Square Enix, Maleficent is featured as a villain, but in all in all but one of the games. Aurora briefly appears in the original Kingdom Hearts as one of the seven princess, princesses of heart. The good fairies also appear in Kingdom Hearts 2, giving Sora new clothes. Diablo, Maleficent's raven, appears in Kingdom Hearts 2 to, res to, res to resurrect his defeated mistress. Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep features a world based on the movie, Enchanted Dominion, and characters who appear are Princess Aurora slash Brian Rose, Maleficent, Maleficent's goons, the three fairies, and Prince Philip, the latter serving as temporary party member for Aqua during her battle against Maleficent and her henchmen. Aurora is also a playable character in the, in, in the, in the game Disney Princess. Continue on to the board game. Walt Disney's Sleepy Beauty game for 1958. It's a Parker Brothers children's board game for two, to, uh, for two to four players based upon Sleepy Beauty. The object of the game is to be the first player holding three different picture cards to reach the castle and, and the space marked the end. Maleficent is featured on the cover of Ravensburger's Disney's villainous board game, of which she is also a playable character. Her goal is to place a curse on each of the four locations in her playable kingdom. Mm. Now you're telling me, let's go to theme parks. Sleepy Beauty was made... It was made while Walt Disney was building Disneyland, hence the six-year production at the time. To help promote the film, Imagineers named the park's icon Sleeping Beauty Castle. It was originally to be Snow White's. An indoor walkthrough exhibit was added to the to the empty castle interior in 1957, where guests could walk through the castle, up uh, up and over the castle entrance, viewing story moment dioramas of the scenes of scenes for the film, which were improved with animated figurines in 1977. It closed shortly after the September 11th, 2001 attacks. Uh, so, uh, uh, supposedly because the dark, unmonitored corridors were a risk. After being closed for seven years, the exhibit space underwent a sense period, uh, period refurbishment to restore the original 1957 delays and reopened to the guests on November 27, 2008. Accommodations were also made on the ground floor with a virtual version for disabled guests unable to navigate stairs. Hong Kong Disneyland opened in 2005, also with a Sleepy Beauty castle, nearly replicating Disneyland's original design. Le Chateau de la Pau au Bois Tourmont at Disneyland Paris is a very a Sleepy Beauty castle. The version found at Disneyland Paris is much more reminiscent of the film's artistic direction. The Chateau features an, an animatronic dragon imagineered to look like Maleficent's dragon form, it is found in the lower level. Uh, level dungeon. La Tania du Dragon. The building also contains Le Cali de la Belle en Bois Dormant, a gallery of, of dis displays which illustrate the story of Sleepy Beauty in tapestries, stained glass, and windows, and figures. Princess Aurora, and to a lesser extent, Prince Philip, Fada, Flora, and Mayweather, Maleficent, and her goons make regular appearances in the parks and parades. Maleficent is featured as one of the villains in the nighttime show. Fantastic at Disneyland at Disney's Hollywood Studios. <laughs> so yay, that's a lot of fun. Continuing on to other appearances, Maleficent's goons appear in the Maroon Cartoon Studio lot in the film Who Framed Roger Rabbit. The bloopers from the film also appear as tween birds that fly around Roger Rabbit's or Ellie Valiant's heads in two scenes. After a refrigerator fell on top of Roger's head and while Eddie Valiant is in two time, the birds are seen again flying around his head until he shoes them away. 
Princess Aurora, Prince Philip, Flora, Fada, Mary, and Meriwether were featured as guests in Disney's House of Mouse, and Maleficent was one of the villains in Mickey's House of Villains. Although not, uh, although not a full a full feature film sequel to the original, the first all new story featuring the characters from the movie Sans Maleficent appeared in Disney Princess Enchanted Tales: Follow Your Dreams. The first volume of the collection of of the Disney princesses. It was released on September fourth, two thousand seven. Mary Gossip, the original voice of Princess Aurora, was not fond of the story, and felt that it did not work. In the American fantasy drama series Once Upon a Time, a live action version of Maleficent appeared in the second episode and the season one finale, as she is an, an adversary of the evil queen, as also sinister. She appears to more prominently. She appears more prominently in the show's fourth season. Her role is played by True Blood actress Kristen Bauer. In season two, season three, and season four, the live-action incarnations of Princess Aurora, Prince Philip, and King Stefan are portrayed by Sarah Bolger, Julia Morris, and Sebastian Roche, respectively. Flora, Fauna, and Meriwether appear in the Disney Channel slash Disney Juniors uh, appear in Disney Channel slash Disney Juniors series. Sophia the First as teaching uh, faculty of Royal Prep, the school. For various kingdoms, princes, and princesses. Princess Aurora also makes a guest appearance in the episode Holiday and Enchantia. Aurora and the other Disney princesses all made guest appearances in the 2018 film Rob Breaks the Editor. And yes, I will talk about that on episode 57, so please keep an eye out for it when it comes out. Uh, stage adaptation. A scaled down, one act stage musical version of the film with, with the title Disney's Sleepy Beauty Kids is often performed by schools and children and children's teachers with book. Uh, with book and additional l l lyrics by Marcy Heisler and Brian Lewisell, the show is composed of 12 musical numbers, including the movie songs. So now you know. Uh, moving on. And finally, for live, and finally, to close out this episode, we have live action film adaptations. A Walt Disney Pictures' live action adaptation of Maleficent, released in May 2014, Angelina Jolie plays the role of Maleficent, and Elle Fanny plays our Princess Aurora. The movie was directed by Robert Stromberg in his directorial debut, produced by Don Hall and John Ruff, and written by Linda Wolverton. A sequel to this film began production in May 2018 and was released in October 2019. As Maleficent, Mistress of Evil. So there you go, my friends. Nice to here. And that's the end of Sleepy Beauty. Yay! Woohoo! After 47 minutes of non-stop talking, we five minutes to the end of the episodes, guys. That was the anniversary edition, so let's get to the final ring for the movie. <coughs> if there's one thing you guys say, Sleepy Beauty did the job done, I promise you, it's one of the best. So therefore, I love this movie, no matter what. On Scott Watson, a rain Sleepy Beauty with a score of 8.5 out of 10. Great to amazing. Love it. 8.5 out of 10. That's pretty good. Nothing to worry about here. So that's great to amazing. Any, any way I can say it, it's definitely one of the best. So, yeah, I love it. But that's only my personal or conservative opinion. Feel free to agree or disagree with any thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. Wait, guys, for that, it's all over. Yay! Thank you all so much for watching another episode of Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. We hope you guys had a lot of fun. Uh, We'll see you later today for, for Moshi Monsters, the movie, the great Moshi Gag, and Moshi Monsters by on today. And, uh, be on the lookout for the Moshi Match League Season 1, Day 16, coming to the show very, very soon. <sighs> because I love it so much. But with that being said, thank you all for watching. I'm your guys, such as yourself, and I will see you next time on Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. Join me next time uh, for Episode 17 as we take a look at 101 Dalmatians. Oh my gosh. One great, big, wonderful motion picture in Technicolor. It's, that's right. It's new. It's Walt Disney's new all-cartoon feature. It's coming your way next time. Episode 17. Uh, movie history, Walt Disney Animation Studios will be, will be about 101 Dalmatians. So please stay tuned for that. We will see you soon. And in the meantime, thanks for watching. I'm Because Sentious. Please remember to leave a like, share this video with your friends, leave a comment down below, and don't forget to subscribe to my channel. Also, turn on notifications to never miss a new video, please. Please subscribe to notifications to turn on to never miss a new video for me as we are on the road to 900 subscribers. That's why we already surpassed 800. Now we're on the way to 900. We're on the road to 900, so please subscribe right now. Otherwise, thank you all for watching. You have a fantastic day. And I'll talk to you guys and girls again next time. We'll see you on Moshi Monster the Movie, The Great Watching Gang, and then on Moshi Monster Party Be Late on today. God bless Heaven Gaming for my for myself and everyone here at Movie History, Walt Disney Animation Studios. I am Miguel Sanchez. Thank you so much for joining in today. And remember, God made you special and he loves you very much. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for watching. Like, fair, subscribe. We'll see you in another video. Thanks for watching, guys. See you in another video. Laters!